Hey, good morning, MRCC. We want to welcome you to our first online Sunday service. We're so happy you're joining us. You know, we are navigating through an interesting time right now, but we want to look forward to this as an opportunity to gather in a new way using technology. And so we believe that the gospel still needs to be heard. Our king is still on the throne. He deserves our praise. So would you join us as we worship him this morning? Let us lift up these words together in praise to our Lord. Let's sing together. We sing, set our eyes on him. Yes. Oh, we look to the sun. Set our eyes on our Savior. See the image of love. Sing his praises forever. Yes, God, we set our eyes on you, Lord. Yes, oh, we look to the sun. Yeah, yes, sing salvation. Salvation, tearing through the dead of night. See the kingdom burst into color at the speed of light. Oh, freedom, shaking up the atmosphere. As the shadows fade into nothing as the day appears. Yes, beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us. The everlasting one. Jesus our God, yes, oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever, oh, we look to the sun, yeah, yeah, it's a creation. Waking up to kingdom come See the hope of heaven Shining like the rising sun Yes Now forever Lifted up from death to life There's no fear in love And no darkness in his endless light Yes, beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our sin. skies above love reaching out for us the everlasting one Jesus our God sing that again church beyond the skies above love reaching out for us the everlasting one Jesus our God Oh, we look to the sun, yeah, yes, yes, Lord, oh, we look to the sun, yeah, yeah, can we sing it out? Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, 
See, Father, we set our eyes on you. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your goodness. Lord, help us remember that you still reign, that you call us to something deeper, God. Father, we praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your word in Romans, which states, the spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Church, let us remember that through all things, through hard times, through a time that we're walking through right now as a church, let us not forget who we belong to, who he's called us to be. So would you join me in praise for our Lord who calls us together as family. You unravel me with the melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Would you sing this with me this morning? I'm no longer a slave. To fear, oh, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child of God. Oh, help us remember from my mother's womb. You have chosen me, for love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Yes, God, your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer, and I'm no longer a slave. Oh, I am a child of God No longer, I'm no longer a slave to fear, no Oh, I, I, I am a child of God Can we sing that again? No longer, no, I'm no longer a slave to fear, no Oh, I am a child God, no longer, I'm no longer a slave to fear, no, oh, I am a child of God, because his love is pursuing us at all times, he's still at work, church, never forget, oh, we praise you, God, we sing, you split the sea so I Right through it, my fears were drowned in perfect love. Yes, whom shall we be, Lord? You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Can we declare that again, church? You split the sea so I could walk right through. My fears were drowned in perfect love. Oh, yes. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. We declare that this morning. Yes, I am a child of God. Full of faith and heart, we declare this together. I am a child of God. One more time, yes, I am a child of God. Because, yes. Father, with your goodness, with your spirit, Lord, whom shall we fear? God, help us to remember who reigns, who's at work, who's in control, who's our constant. God, you are faithful. 
We declare your goodness this morning. We thank you for your presence. And we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, church. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Well, good morning, church. This is a little different. Uh, it's great to be with you in a different way this morning and to welcome you to our first online worship service here at MRCC. Just want to remind you what we talked about a little bit earlier in the week, which is that God's got this. He's going to get this through. He's going to get us through this. Let's just take this opportunity to be the church in a new and different way and let God use us in a new and different way. This morning, we're just going to continue our study in Mark's gospel. We're in chapter 5, beginning with verse 21 this morning. So if you want to grab your Bible and turn there and get ready. And while you're doing that, um, you know, let me ask you, how, how much of your life feels like it's hurried? How much of your life feels like it's hurried too much? Uh, raise your hand if you feel like you could have used more time yesterday, today, if you're worried about how much time you're going to have tomorrow. Do you ever wish, like I sometimes do, that you could just call a time out, make everything stop for a few minutes so that you could pull things together and get your bearings? I think that's very real in the world that we live in. I think that's always been a challenge for us as human beings. And there's a reason for it, and God wants to talk to us about that this morning through this story in Mark's Gospel. Sometimes I, I wish, wouldn't it be cool if I could just pull a giant lever and make everything stop for a little while so I could pull myself together and get organized. Most of us feel like that. Most people live with a kind of low-grade panic or hurry in their lives. They feel like there's never enough time. They feel like they're falling behind. They live with a constant awareness of, of time passing by, time slipping away, tomorrow coming too soon. Whether it's the kids growing up too fast or our bodies slowing down too soon, or the weekend slipping away before we're ready. We hate daylight savings time in the spring. We love it in the fall. And very often we're in such a hurry that, that we lose time for really bad jokes. And that's a tragedy in itself because of what we miss out on. You know I have no shame. And you heard the story about the man who went to the doctor. And when he got to the exam room, the nurse said, we have to hurry up and get you seen as fast as we can. And the man said, why, why are we in such a hurry? And she said, well, because you're an adult and this is a pediatrician's office. And the man said, what's that got to do with anything? He's still a doc, right? And the nurse said, yes, but being a pediatrician means he's had very little patience. Yes, I just said that. Yes, I did. Bear with me. How much of your life is spent in a worried hurry. We are the richest people in the history of the world material-wise and also the most time poor. And that's significant because God meets us in time. And it affects us, this, this hurry affects us at the level of our souls. You know, the reality is that most of us feel like we don't even have time to wait on the Lord. And that's a tragedy. The psalmist says in Psalm 27, verse 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for him. The prophet Isaiah declares, blessed are those who wait for the Lord. And the King James renders Isaiah the prophet in chapter 40, verse 31 this way, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they will mount up as wing, with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. W what a promise for this time we're going through. God is calling on us to wait on him. Something that we have a hard time doing if our worry turns us into people who always hurry. You know, here's the reality. Your soul and mine is not made to hurry. It was never designed to race deadlines, to race traffic, to race death. Your soul is made for eternity, unlimited time. It's meant to thrive in timelessness. Just like creation itself, your soul was made to last forever. 
and to do so unhurried by worry, like the mountains and the stars and the oceans do, like saints do, like people in love do, like Jesus did. Someone who was never in a hurry. Our Lord, the one we follow, the one we call Savior and Master, was never in a hurry. And God wants to talk to us about that reality this morning. What would you be willing to trade for an unhurried life? There's something to think about. People who choose to believe in Jesus are people learning that they don't have to hurry because he sets us free from worry. I invited you to turn to Mark chapter 5, beginning with verse 21. Let's follow along in this story of Jesus engaging with a man who, because of his worry, is in a great hurry. And let's watch what he does in this man's life. The scripture tells us, Mark chapter 5, beginning with verse 21, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Jesus knew all about the hustle and bustle, the pressure of crowds, the pressure of expectations. His life was just like yours and mine in this regard. He felt what we feel. He wasn't separated from it. He lived through it and above it. We see him doing that in this moment. And we find him confronted by the need, at least in the heart of the man coming to him, to hurry. Because the Bible tells us that in the middle of this, one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. And seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. It's not easy to see and feel and understand that this man was in a desperate hurry. His daughter was seriously sick, sick unto death. Is there anything more horrible? No, there isn't. Every one of us as parents would rather sacrifice ourselves than see our kids suffer. And this man is feeling that. By the way, that's why God tells us the story of his love through us through the word picture of a father losing a son because he wants us to know how deeply he feels for us. This man is feeling that kind of thing. His daughter is desperately sick, and he comes to Jesus in a hurry. He reaches out to Jesus, and, and Jesus answers. Verse 24 tells us that Jesus went with him immediately. He responded to the man's need. This is important to, to take in for just a moment before we move on. Church, God is never reluctant to respond to the needs in our lives. The personality of Jesus makes this clear. For the Bible teaches us that Jesus is God revealed, God made known. God shrunk down into human form so that our eyes and minds and hearts can perceive him and understand what he's saying to us. That's why Jesus is called the Word of God. If he hadn't done this, if he hadn't compressed himself into human form, he would remain too big to see, like trying to look at everything at the same time. But the scripture says that he came as a human being. The sun, verse, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, tells us, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. Colossians tells us in chapter 1, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 9, anyone who has seen me, has seen the Father. So when we see the Lord's response to this man, we see God's heart. We see God's heart for us. And we understand that he is not deaf to the cry of the brokenhearted. You can rest assured that when you bring your desperation to God, he hears you and he responds. You know, when I think about this, it reminds me of a moment in our family's life when Isaiah was small, just a toddler, and Ron and I were awakened in the middle of the night by a desperate scream from his room, just a, a cry of need. And, and I remember running down the hall and coming into his room in the middle of the night, found him weeping, and he had in his hand his favorite teddy bear, Bernard. He had the body of Bernard in one hand and the head in the other. Somehow during the middle of the night, he'd twisted them off. Uh, he had this habit of twisting his bear as he slept, and on this particular night he had twisted his bear's head off and uh, when Ron and I realized what was happening is all we could do not to laugh of course but we also felt his 
pain in that moment. And so mom, it's kind of become a legend in our family. Mom, uh, it's two in the morning, but she got out the sewing machine and put Bernard's head back on. And because mom was so tired, uh, we have Bernard to this day and his head is slightly crooked facing the wrong way. But it was enough for Isaiah. Uh, he took him back to his bedroom, slept like a baby. And that bear is there as a reminder to this day to Isaiah and to us about how much mom cares so much that she would get out the sewing machine in the middle of the night. God is like that. And Jesus is revealing that to us in this moment. But here's the thing, church, take this in. In Isaiah's little head and heart, it took way too long to fix the problem. He wanted it fixed right away. Uh, it took him a long time to wait for mom to get out the sewing machine and restore the bear, put him back together again. He shed a lot of tears before mom fixed his bear. So do we sometimes, as we find ourselves living in that space between Jesus' response and our experience of that response. We see that in this story. So, so Jesus goes with Jairus to heal his daughter, but the hurry and the hustle come along with him as well. Look at verse 24 and following. The Bible says, A large crowd followed as Jesus went with Jairus, and they pressed around them. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She also had a need. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, had spent all she had, but instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. Now, let me pause for just a moment here and also point something out to us. And that is that even when you come to God timidly and secretly, approaching him from the backside, so to speak, because you're afraid or ashamed or, or maybe you're just an introvert in a crowd, he is still there for you. All he is looking for is your willingness to come to him. The gospel is less a test of some mystical faith and it's a test of your willingness to be honest with God. And this woman was in this moment. But that's when this story takes a gut-wrenching turn as far as Jairus is concerned. Remember, he's in a hurry. He's got to get Jesus back to his house ASAP because his daughter's life hangs in the balance. But instead of hurrying, Jesus slows down. Jesus turns to a different issue. Look at verse 30. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, and he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? Maybe if you have your Bible, you underline that phrase, He turned around. Because imagine how that felt to Jairus in that moment. He's in a hurry. He thinks things have to happen now. He's desperate. He has a, a faith in Jesus. That's why he approached him. That's why he asked him to help him. But he also believes in hurry. He believes it has to happen now in a hurry. And in the middle of that, Jesus stops moving. He turns around and gives his attention to this woman in the crowd. I wonder, does it ever seem to you like God's turned around when you're in a hurry? like he's dealing with something else when you wish he would be dealing with something in front of you? Do you ever feel that in the lives of people you love, friends or family? You know what Jairus is thinking in this moment? He's thinking, you can't stop. You can't turn around. I need you to do this now. I need you to hurry. I'm running out of time here. But our Lord did turn around. He did stop. He refused to join Jairus in his hurry. Why do you think he did that? We make ourselves prisoners of time and we panic when God slows down or seems to stop. We despair when he doesn't move as fast as we want him to. We beg him to hurry as if time were running out. But here's the thing, church. Jesus knows better. He knows time isn't running out. He knows he's got this situation under control. He knows a secret, two of them in fact, 
Let me take a moment and explain them to you. First, God sees a much bigger picture than we do, just like we see a bigger picture than our kids do. For example, God tells us in his word that there's a very specific reason why he hasn't hurried to put an end to all the ugliness and darkness in the world today. It's because he's still seeking to reach people who don't know him yet. He's giving them time. He's being patient with them. He's waiting for them because he's not in a hurry. Because he is seeking them more than he is fearful of time getting away from him. And he's free to wait because he's not under the illusion that time is running out. He knows it isn't. And because of that, he asks you and me to wait a little, to be patient, to trust him when he stops or slows down because time really isn't running out. We, we know the end of this story. We know how it's, it's going to turn out. Jairus is living this story. He doesn't know it yet. And we're like him in this moment. And God, when he doesn't hurry, sometimes it troubles us. But 2 Peter chapter 3, for example, verse 9, tells us that, that God isn't in a hurry because he sees a bigger picture. The Bible tells us that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That, that verse comes from a section in 2 Peter chapter 3 that reminds us that there will always be those who point to now as if it's forever, but it isn't. God says, ignore them. In fact, in verse 36 of chapter 5 of Mark, this very story we're reading, he's going to give that specific advice to Jairus and his wife. He's going to say, ignore the crowd that's mocking and saying it's too late. Ignore them, because it isn't. He's going to say they're fools. They lie to themselves like much of our world does and pretend that, that, that death can be ignored, that judgment isn't real, that God isn't who he says he is. But time will tell. Time will tell. And Jesus isn't in a hurry because he sees a bigger picture. Jairus doesn't fully understand that yet. He doesn't know, he doesn't feel yet that the whole world actually doesn't revolve around his now, as desperate as it may be. It also revolves around the seeking woman, and in fact many others, and that God will take his time to seek everyone who seeks because he's not afraid of time running out. And he wants us to not be afraid, afraid either. Look at verses 32 and 33 of chapter 5 of Mark. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. The delay goes on and on. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. Church, did you know that that's all God is seeking from every one of us, just to tell him the whole truth? When you and I get honest with God, he gets real with us. We experience him. When we enter into that kind of gut level honesty with him, it's in those moments that our experience of him grows. I've told the story before that I shot my grandpa's car once when I was a boy. Uh, I won't go into it today, but after I did it, then I lied about it. My grandfather knew better. Years later, as a grown-up, when I came to him and confessed what I had done, he said, yeah, I know. <laughs> and that's when our relationship was restored because I had come clean. That same reality is there for us. If you'll get gut level real and honest with God, that's when your experience of him expands. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 1 that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteous. So we claim we haven't sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. He's just looking for that honesty. Now this woman hasn't sinned, but she also hasn't been honest. Now she is. And that's what Jesus was seeking all along. Verse 34 tells us, he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. She was already freed from her physical suffering, but now she's freed from that neurotic sense of disconnect that's in every one of us ever since Adam and Eve until we are real and honest with God. 
That's the first secret is that God sees a bigger picture. But there's another secret that Jesus knows that Jairus doesn't know yet. And that's that Jesus, hear me now, church, is much more than a healer. Imagine Jairus in this moment desperate for God to hurry because he thinks of him as if the greatest part of who he is is his power to heal. But his power goes much further than that. Hurry, which doesn't recognize that, can make us despair. And that's what happens in verse 35. Catch this moment. Talk about a poignant moment. Talk about an emotional moment. The Bible says, while Jesus was still speaking to the woman he'd stopped for, to the woman he turned around to. While he was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. And here's what they said. Your daughter is dead. It's too late. You didn't hurry enough. God didn't move fast enough. Your daughter is dead. And then listen to what they say. Why bother the teacher anymore? Sometimes we feel like that. Sometimes we say to ourselves, the circumstances have gone to the point, why bother? We think of God's power as being limited to certain parts of our lives. And when he doesn't move fast enough in the power we think he has, then we can come to this place of despair. Jairus is brought face to face with that kind of moment. Try to put yourself in his shoes. How would you feel? You had gone to Jesus, you were trying to get him to your house, you were trying to get him to hurry, he wasn't hurrying. And then your neighbors, your friends arrive and they say, it's too late. The reality is you and me might be tempted in that moment to say, why bother? I hear people say, why bother like that all the time. They say it about their marriages. They say it about their friendships or their dreams, or their kids. Sometimes they say it about their church, or their nation, or their world, or they say it about themselves, or they say it about life itself, why bother? But that's because they don't know Jesus as, they, as he is yet. They think of him in a limited way. They do not recognize that they're talking to the Son of God, God the Son. The scripture tells us that in verse 36, Jesus did something I love. The Bible says, ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. What do you think went through Jairus' head and heart when he heard Jesus say that? The unbelieving crowd laughed at him. Verse 40 tells us explicitly that they laughed to his face. Much of the world around us laughs when we grab hold of that promise that Jesus gives us. But he does give it to us. He calls us to put away our fear. He reminds us that he's got this. He calls us to ignore the world's despair. What a thing to remember in this moment in our culture's history, in our nation's history. Jesus calls us to ignore those who despair. He says, don't, believe, uh, don't be afraid, just believe. Ignore the way the world around us pretends to know what it's talking about. Ignore the ridiculous conclusions it comes to, like the lie that there is no God, or the lie that says no one can know him, or the lie that says his promises are fantasies. He calls us instead to not be afraid, just believe. And he does this because he knows it's only a matter of time until he shuts all them up. <laughs> until he laughs at their laughter. The scripture tells us in verse 38, when they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. And he went into the house and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And the Bible says they laughed at him. How did he respond to that? He put them all out, took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went into the bedroom where Jairus' daughter was. Now, it's at this point in the story that you and me know what's coming. We, we can feel it. 
Because we know him, we can feel it like a, like a big wave gathering out to sea, like a big sunrise gathering up behind that mountain that looms over our little town, like a, like a big roar starting to run around Century Link Field. Only this one's 10 times, 100 times, a bazillion times more significant because it's the sound of angels getting ready to sing and of mom and dad getting ready to find out, just like Miracle Max said in The Princess Bride, that there's a big difference between being only mostly dead and dead. Jesus is about to transform this moment. You see, church, understand, we, we're outside of Jairus' time. And so we're not afraid. We know what's coming. We have the glorious advantage of hindsight, which is like having faith because it says that that which isn't yet will be. Sitting here reading this story, we got plenty of time. We're in no hurry. We're not feeling what Jairus was feeling because we know it's only a little while before his tears are wiped away and replaced with ecstatic joy. And we're leaning into that moment. We're looking forward to that moment. The time it takes for that joy to, to arrive is not a problem for us. And it's not a problem for believers. It's not a problem for those of us who put our faith more in what Jesus says than anything else in the world. That's how it is for Christ followers. We hear God saying loud and clear in the midst of everything, don't be afraid, just believe. And for the people who do, there is a kind of freedom from worry and hurry. The Bible says that he went into that room and he took her by the hand. Yes, he did just like he will take the hand of everyone who believes. Isaiah Lund and Lincoln Person and Caleb Graham and your mom and dad and my praying Baptist grandmother and your crazy Pentecostal uncle and Della Stigelmeyer and anybody else you and me can name, including you and me. Everyone who trusts him will be taken by the hand when the time is right. And every reason we worried and hurried will be washed away. Everyone who trusts him will be taken by the hand, no matter how long we've been counting worms in some hole in the ground, no matter how long we've been watching our hair turn gray and our kids grow old and our strength grow weak, no matter how much time seems to steal from us, no matter how the final grave pretends to be final, he's going to take us by the hand and undo everything we wept over. Jesus took her by the hand and then, I love this, he spoke to her. She's dead, but he's talking to her. He spoke to her corpse. You know why? Because our Savior sees dead people, if I can steal a line from a popular movie. Sometimes he calls up old friends like Moses and Elijah. He says, hey, fellas, let's meet up on the mountain today and freak out the disciples. Let's watch Peter babble on like an idiot. That's how guys love each other. It's awesome. Jesus sees dead people and he talks to them because he knows. He knows that he's much more than a healer. The crowd says he's crazy. They say you can't talk to dead people because their time has run out. They say that when your time runs out, it's over. Like Bill Paxton said, game over, man, game over. But Jesus says, no, that's not real. He says that when the clock strikes midnight, uh, the world says when the clock strikes midnight, Cinderella's story comes to an end, but that's because they're prisoners of time. But let me tell you a secret about the prison of time. Jesus has the keys. He built a back door. He whooped up on the jailer and took away his badge. And since he did, he goes around talking to dead people and calling them back to life. Your dead people, my dead people, even you and me when we're dead people. And he doesn't just talk to them. He commands them. Yes, he does. He gives them orders and they obey. No U.S. Marine ever snapped to attention like dead people do when Jesus starts barking at them. He tells them to get up and quit laying around like a bunch of pickles. There's living to do, eternal living. He tells them to get up and, and give mom and dad a hug because there's a whole bunch more future than they thought there was. He gives new meaning to the phrase, the walking dead, if I can just mix metaphors for a moment. And when he talks to the dead people, they can't stay down. They bounce up and start carrying on like a bunch of women at a jack 
jazzercise convention. You could even say he's the Richard Simmons of graveyards, if I can stretch it that far. And he says to her, Talitha Kum, the scripture tells us, phrase means little girl, get up. And she did. She got up. She stood back up on her feet with life in her eyes and little girl stuff on her mind and that same lopsided grin she used to get when she played basketball with her dad in the backyard. And for those of us who watch too much TV, this isn't no half alive, make believe, pretend person. This is her. This is their daughter, just the way they remembered her. This is mom and dad's little girl. And she isn't the only thing that came back to life. Mom and dad's souls came back to life too. The joy they thought they'd never feel again, it's there. The hope they thought they would never know again, it's a blazing furnace of thanksgiving and faith that nobody will ever be able to extinguish again because now there won't be any more Saturdays in the synagogue, no tame Saturdays. Now there's been a resurrection. Now they know that Jesus isn't just a teacher. He isn't just a healer. He is the Son of God. Jairus knows that now. He feels that now. He knows that we can't run out of time, that there's always enough time. Because of Jesus, time isn't a prison. It's a gift. If death is dead and life is in the hands of this man, then I can slow down and live like it. I can wait on the Lord because I know that even if my daughter isn't healed, she will be resurrected. I can be fearless and full of faith and fed by my Father from my first day on earth to my first day in my eternal home. For crying out loud, he even resurrects himself. That's who we're talking about. You see, church, because of Jesus, there's enough time for your soul to slow down and to trust and to love and to live and to enter into an unhurried, unworried life with peace and hope, even in the midst of the painful patience God asks of us as he seeks to reach those who haven't yet received him. You know, Phil Collins and the Supremes had it right all along. You can't hurry love. You'll just have to wait. <laughs> but we wait in faith. And here's the bottom line, church. God calls you and me to trust him. Don't be afraid, just believe. Even when he doesn't hurry, even when he's not moving as fast as you desperately think you need him to, he says, I got this, Greg. I got this. He says that to you, he says that to me, and he calls us to believe it. So church, as we enter into this season, let it be with a confidence that Jesus and his power has this under control. Let it be with a, a confidence in his promise. Don't be afraid. Just believe. I got this. You'll be together again pretty soon. My church is under my control. My mission is under my control. You are under my control. And let us, knowing that, Turn to those around us and serve them in faith. Knowing that, let us in an unworried, unhurried way be the example of believing people that God calls us to be. I want to challenge you to own that today. Who is it that God is calling you to serve, to bear witness to by your serving, by your faith, by your confidence, by your unhurried, unworried journey through this time? Who is it that God is calling you to help? Let's pray together. Would you bow your heads? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the picture it paints of a God who's not hurried because he's not worried. God, let us feel that. Let us enter into that. Let us hand over to you the things we, we, we want you to hurry over and wait on you instead. Like your word says, blessed are those who wait on the Lord. Make us a people who wait on you, God. 
Holy Spirit, I pray you'd invade every home, every room where your church is gathered this morning and plant in us a confidence in you that will carry us all the way through these next few weeks and, and way beyond it. Lord, remind us that your invitation is to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that everything else will be taken care of. God, lead us as we seek to seek your kingdom in our neighborhood, in our workplace, in our school, right where we are in the middle of this. We pray for that. Send us there full of faith. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I'm going to give the benediction and just trust that you're standing. <laughs> now may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with you throughout this week. Go with God. Tell someone you love them. See you next week.